It is Six Towns Radio. In March, the Stranglers' definitive tour is kicking off in Liverpool. And on the telephone right now to talk about that and more, we've got JJ Bennell. Hello and welcome to the show. Oh, hi, how are you doing? I'm really well, thank you. Uh, how hard is it to be definitive when going on a definitive tour? Well, it's, a few people have asked me this, but it actually uh, is another meaning of the word definitive. It means uh, also what defines you. So it's pretty. It's a pretty broad um, definition. So it just about covers everything that we do. <laughs> yeah, because there's so many great songs. Um, you're going to get people who want certain songs that you're not going to play. What do you do about that? Um, let them go home disappointed. But hopefully, <laughs> <laughs> hopefully, um, we've got other songs to compensate. I mean, it's really difficult, you know, when you've had 17 albums. And I don't know how many singles, but to to choose a set list, and we never really want to do exactly the same thing year in and year out because it, for us it would be boring. And I think for the audience, those who come regularly, it might be. So you know we have to mix it up, and and um, <clears throat> there's always going to be loads of songs left out. I know, I'm only joking. To be honest, if you're a Stranglers fan, you're going to love loads of songs and there's going to be some of them in there for you. Plus, like you say, you're mixing it up. So as a fan who comes to more than one gig, who maybe comes every time you you tour, you want to hear more songs. (laughs) That's right. Well, I mean, we do do chop and change on a nightly basis. Although sometimes uh, when you get a set, it just flows really well and and, um, it's just, you know, you hit the mark each time, then... You try not to change it so much, but yeah, we've got enough to, to mix, mix it about, really. Yeah, you must be pleasantly surprised still how the songs have held up. You hear them everywhere on TV, adverts. Yeah, of course, yeah, because you, you think it's it's part of its time when it's released and uh, and then you, you forget about it. But um, some songs just develop legs and, and uh, enter the public consciousness, so... I mean, you can't ask for better than that if you're if you're a songwriter. Exactly. You must have a favourite song to play, or does that change year on year? Uh, well, it, it's not only a favourite song. There are quite a, quite a few uh, songs which uh, you enjoy playing for whatever reason. You know, they're, they're fun. You love the reaction that they get, but also sometimes they're technically challenging, and um, that keeps you on your toes. You know, especially there are a couple of songs that. If you miss one beat, you are completely screwed. You know, so um, you, you know the whole band falls apart. So these are kind of weird tech time signatures. So that's a challenge, and that keeps you keeps you from falling asleep on stage. That would be the worst thing. You know, the worst thing is to just be going through the motions. Yeah, I think uh, for me, I grew up, um, I was a little bit late to the party for the punk scene and I was only five in 77, so <laughs> the, my first entry level uh, song was Golden Brown and I can remember buying the single okay. and then obviously buying albums after that and buying previous albums. I mean, but I think that's how a lot of people have got into, um, not necessarily the standards, but into a lot of um, artists is, uh, <clears throat> you know, they might pick up on, on a big hit of theirs and then they check out their back catalogue and um, that, I mean that's a great way to discover any artistry yeah and the song No More Heroes is about the fact that you were the anti-heroes um, because it was a new era and people was, were just yeah. standing up and that's a great way to look at it and I suppose now in 2018 I think uh, we lack anti-heroes well <laughs> well I think Trump could be one <laughs> for most people uh, it's you know the thing is the, the the problem is that people are built up into heroes and everything. And, yeah. um, I think we use the word uh, a bit too freely. Um, it's it's like the word love. You know, the word love is used too freely, um, and it's just one of those things. But I mean, we we now we're we're in a period where here the the bubble of heroes is burst on a regular basis. You know, we find out about the people who were in the public eye or who we, we looked up to or admired uh, have got feet of play, you know. Yeah. Your remit as a band was to go out there, perform, play music for the masses, and you're still doing that after 40-odd years, which is great. Well, well we, lo- we love doing it. And we f- we're fortunate enough, and, and I have seen the opposite, we're fortunate enough to get on really well with each other. And, um, and I think that's the, the key. Uh, you know, if you get on well with each other, then you can work better together because there's nothing more toxic than p- 
people, you know, people who've fallen out with each other and, and hate each other, and, but are just still uh, together for the sake of it or for the money, yeah. which is really not really not a healthy situation to be found in. Oh yeah, for sure. And um, I've just noticed on the press release that um, you said the seven album six studio one live are due for a re-release as well. So people who didn't get hold of them. Uh, in the first instances, we've got a chance to get them again. Is it going to be vinyl releases? Do you know? Oh yeah, there is. Yeah, I mean, there's there's such a demand for vinyl again, a renewal of interest in vinyl. Yeah. And um, let's to be honest, um, when you compare vinyl to CD, there's a huge difference. Mm-hmm. Vinyl is such a richer sound. But yeah, the uh, well, Universal who took over the EMI catalog are going to release stuff. Which has nothing to do with us, apart yeah. from that, the fact that we performed on these uh, albums and wrote them. But uh, it wasn't our decision to release them. Nevertheless, you know, it's um, I'm all into recycling. Yeah, the record company does have a hold on you a lot of the time. Yeah. I suppose there's been yeah. uh, periods when they've released songs or not released songs you wanted to release. Um, no, that's never been the case with us. We've been really lucky. The only time we had something which. Uh, we went against the record company was when they didn't want to release Golden Brown and we insisted that they should release it because we felt we felt instinctively that it it had something um, so we had to um, force the record company <laughs> to, re- to release Golden Brown would yeah. you believe and then they so they released it just before Christmas and in those days uh, just before Christmas it was just like an avalanche of singles and I think they by releasing it at Christmas they thought that um, that would be the end of the affair and it would just disappear. And unfortunately for them, it, it developed legs and became a worldwide hit. So then after that, they asked us for another Golden Brown. Yeah, <laughs> that's what they do. Yeah, uh, well, it's a good job they did get Golden Brown out there with you because, like I say, I would not have been listening to you straight after. Well, exactly. So, <laughs> you know, we went against the what they wanted <laughs> let's talk a little bit more about the touring then so obviously you still love doing it it's a different kettle of fish as opposed to how it was when you started out with the crowds sure. but um yeah, i know that um there was a lot of drunken behavior back in the day and yeah. that sort of has happened since but not on the same scale <laughs> well i mean at the time we were fighting to get an audience you mm. know and um, and there was so much uh so much prejudice against bands like us at the time um, because people hadn't had just read the, the press uh, hysteria and, and the TV uh, news but hadn't actually seen the bands um, so there was a lot of prejudice and, and then of course a lot of people decided that they would um, challenge us so to speak uh, in, in the hall in the dance halls and in the concert halls so I mean we were fighting to make our own audience I mean, now people know what, sort of know what to expect with the Stranglers. So, I mean, it's our audience. They come to see us, not to wreck our gig or attack the punks, you know. Yeah, I've, I've seen a clip on YouTube of somebody trying to have a go at you, throwing a pint at you in recent times, but uh, they must have known about you being a black belt. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, you know, you have to, you have, you, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> what do you do? When someone, <laughs> you know, to like nearly 40 years after, still thinks that that's the thing to do, you know, so kind of... I mean, it's dangerous for a start in, in, for, on so many different levels. You know. Exactly. Uh, but also, it's uh, a sign of a complete sign of disrespect. And sometimes you have to demand to be respected. So I didn't beat the person up. I just gave them a little bitch slap and told them to behave. <laughs> <laughs> that is the way. Uh, finally, JJ, um, there's a short film. It's called The Best Night of Roxy's Life that you were in a couple oh, of years right, ago yeah, with Izzy yeah. Sooty. I've not seen it, but where can people find this? Is it something you can watch online? Oh, I don't know. I don't know what happened to it. It's um, a sweet little uh, film with uh, Izzy Sooty and Philip Jackson. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, I just make a little cameo appearance in it, and I think I'm meant to be sort of a, um, a Serge Gainsbourg type <laughs> person in it. But it's uh, it's really it's it's a bittersweet little thing. It's lovely. Yeah. Uh, where you can get it, I don't know. I don't even know if it's on YouTube. We will have to search that one out. Well, the tour, the definitive tour, starts in March. We'll catch you on that. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you today, JJ Bernal. Thank you. Thanks very much. It's lovely. All the best.